Agent Carter, Season 2, Episode 3, Thoughts. This episode is called Better Angels, another episode I love. Spoilers for everything MCU leading up to and including this episode, but not for anything that came out in the MCU after this episode first premiered. Let's dive in. So, yeah, evidence has been planted suggesting that Wilkes is a Russian spy, and yeah, Peggy points out if he's a, you know, if he really was a spy, would he not know better than to just leave all of this evidence, you know, in one place? This is too convenient. And yeah, we see Howard indeed work on directing, which I don't know, it felt like a joke that didn't really land. Like, Peggy and Edwin are both smart people. Why would they stand in the shot? Like, just, like, move in a, in a, give, give it a wide berth, move around to walk near him, and then, you know, wait for him to call cut. But they seem to legitimately not know. Like, it would be one thing if they were, like, rushing, and it was like, forget about the movie, but they seem to actually accept, yeah, I, it's, it, Sometimes MCU jokes just don't quite land. And, yeah, so they, they talk about the the club, and I do appreciate this criticism of, yeah, of, you know, an, an old social club that only lets in white men. You know, what was it Howard said? They're usually male and pale. And yeah, we see, we see Whitney, you know, t trying to figure out the properties of the of the zero matter now that it's on her, you know, and she's choosing to hide it from from Calvin until she figures out what to do. And yeah, Thompson shows up, being a jerk as always. I, I will say I am, you know, I look forward to finding out exactly where he's going to land. Because in this episode, Peggy really calls him out. And by the end of the episode, he's seen proof that there's something more going on here. Because the newspaper headline that she saw was the one that he was shown at the end. So there's something there. And he has, in, in the first season, he did prove that he was capable of selflessness and you know so so yeah i'm i'm looking forward to to seeing if that where that goes exactly so i feel like the bit where howard leads a, leads a bunch of women into the the club you know that's supposed to be like you know, em empowering and this sort of joke about, oh, look, the, now they have to deal with these women. But it's still, like, using women as, like, you know, it's essentially weaponizing them. It, yeah, I just, I, I think that something, I think that it would have been more, uh, would have delivered the, the point about the, the, club being so closed to so many people better if Howard said by the way I have a friend who would love to join the club and he lists off all this person's achievements gives maybe like an IQ score you know back then people still believed IQ was accurate rather than you know extremely biased you know st stuff like that and then when the, you know, once he's done, you know, he, he completely bowls over this, the, the guy, Mr. Terrence, Torrance, something like that. I hope it's not Torrance. If, if so, please do not leave him alone with his family at the Overlook Hotel. But yeah, you know, bowling over Terrence and then once, you know, and, and Terrence is like, this guy, you know, sounds great. When can I meet him? And then Howard says, well, she can be here tomorrow or something like that you know but here it's basically like he's basically you know 
bashing Terrence in the head with a bunch of women, which still makes women the you know the women are are objects here, and it also like I mean, this is the kind you know, women th feminist protesters have done this sort of thing, showing up places that they were not you know allowed to be. That there was sometimes violence as part of that, so I don't I don't think it's this cute funny joke. It's like oh, bet he didn't see that come. I mean, he does call security. We end up not seeing any violence there, but like, yeah, you know, civil rights sadly have you know civil rights protests and and activism has frequently been met with violence, including in America. So. It's not really this funny joke. I mean, ultimately, we don't see any. But if this had been, had you know, actually, I I don't remember for sure. I feel like I did read about something very similar to this happening in real life. And and yeah, there was there was violence there. So it's you know, yeah, it's 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 not this this cute joke that the in, in real life, that the show presents at times. And... Right, I, I like the detail I, I meant to mention. When when Whitney is hiding the, the zero matter from Calvin and talking about, you know, maybe she'll retire from acting, you know, he says, I mean, I think you should wait until... You know, he, he essentially expects her to wait until the, the Senate campaign has has is is done, and then he says, you know, that after the after I'm senator, you can have all the babies you want to, because that's in his mind, you know, those are the options, the the two options for women, career and baby making, and yeah, the the based on her, the look on her face, that is definitely not what she had in mind, and you know, later in the episode we learn. She's way smarter than people usually give her credit for. She's a, a genius, scientific genius. I will say I quite liked when when Peggy manages to hide, like, because they do this thing where the camera, you know, is on on her with the with the door opening thing, and then the camera moves, and the door opens, and a bunch of people come out, and then you know the camera pans further over, and she managed to hide behind the door, which. Yeah, you know, it's I, I could see how she could very very quickly, you know, the moment that she perceives oh the door's opening, she just you know very quickly r rushes over to hide behind the door. And you know, I've I've played enough uh, thief games, all all four of them in my time to know that you can in fact run on there's there's like carpet there that's not going to make any noise at all. It's not like it was like stone or marble or something, and yeah. So they have an anti-listening device thing that just destroys the bugs. It's very, very effective, and and really underlines. Yeah, they, you know, this is not their first day. They've been, they're well aware that there might be counter counterintelligence. And yeah, Edwin and and Peggy pretend that she just got lost on the way to the powder room. Which you know, there's another misogynistic joke there, but at, at least they're getting one over on the on the guard, who's like, you know, because he thinks women are are these silly, unintelligent people. That means that he's not gonna further pursue and and investigate. Yeah, and then we get the scene where Peggy calls out uh, Thompson, which, yeah, just really great. And and I love the gravity. Like, it doesn't immediately go, like, after she said it, there's, like, two or three seconds of just silence. You know, you see his face, and you see her face, and she's like, I don't know that she's sorry she said it, but she does realize I just said that, you know, there is this, like, you know, this is not, technically he is still her boss, you know, they're not, 
they're not just like colleagues or something. He is technically the boss. And yeah, really appreciate it. and and you know, she's right. The things she says are 100% right. He's being a coward. He's covering for someone else, hoping someone will pin a medal to him. And later on, you know, there is the line about, you know, if it were up to me, you'd give, you'd get a medal. And it is like, oh, that's, mmm. You mean that as a compliment, but that actually sort of stings. You know, that's like, <laughs> yeah. You know, Thompson would have liked it better if he said something like, you know, I know you're not doing this for medals or something like that, but no, that makes it sound like, you know, that's that's like, a, um, almost like he's he's get going to his master and being, being petted on the head and being told, good boy, or something. And, yeah, and, and Thompson sends her to... New York. By the end of the episode, she hasn't gone, but by the end of the episode, he has seen proof that she was right. So, I can imagine there there's going to be a, a thing there that she won't have to, that he won't ask her to go something. And let's see, yeah, and and they managed to make Wilkes, Doctor Wilkes, uh, visible, but not immediately tangible and the I will say the thing you know say ah you know and and yeah you, you do it because you know Howard's a, a professional and if Howard had said please open your mouth I want to spray this stuff right into your you know Wilkes might have been like is there a second option you know but yeah it's just and then Wilkes says that he's been shadowing Peggy ever since. So that's slightly creepy. I appreciate that there had to be something that, that he had. I don't know. I mean, yeah, because he didn't know about Howard's lab. So he did kind of have to, he couldn't just have gone there directly. Yeah, I don't know. It just felt a little creepy to me. And... Yeah, it, at, at first it doesn't even last very long, the, the stuff used to, to make him visible, but they do a better job with that later in the episode. Great to see Stark working on, like, figuring something out. Uh, you know, I, I'm not the biggest fan of all the misogynistic jokes about all the women he gets with. And... Yeah, very cool when Peggy confronts Whitney and, yeah, you know, threatens her and makes very clear, you know, I know. And, yeah, at first, Calvin really doesn't take Whitney's concern seriously. He's reading the paper, he's in the other room, he's barely paying attention. And, you know, when he repeats back the stuff she said, like, he might as well say yada, yada, yada. You know, he's, he's clearly not, you know. And then, you know, she brings up Mr. Hunt, who he says, you know, always already been used too much recently, you know, it's this is very dangerous. I didn't know Ethan Hunt's father was such a bad guy. And, yeah, uh, Whitney fake cries to get him to call Mr. Hunt, who is, of course, the person attacking Peggy in the very next scene and yeah I mean I, I will say at least the I don't know maybe maybe the the Whitney's act is is growing on me I, I yeah I, I don't know maybe, maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna hold all final judgment on it because it, it kind of worked for me in in this scene I, I quite like that, you know, she pointed out, you know, she at, at first he's not really, he doesn't care that much, but then she says something like, you know, I would hate for this to have a negative effect on the campaign, and immediately he's like, oh, crap, you know, so, yeah, that was, yeah, very, very nicely done there, Whitney. 
and yeah, so Peggy boxes to to you know get the the tension out, and we have this brief thing of you know Edward's like, would you like a sparring? Would you like to spar with someone? And because she hits the the, I can never remember what y'all call it in English. See, in Danish, it's it's nice and easy. If you want to box, use a boxing bag. But y'all call it this with sandbag? I, I forget, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, yes, so, you know, she hits it so hard that Edwin's like, because I'm sure Howard could arrange for someone, you know. it's At first, he's like, you know, I've done some boxing in my day. And then she, because she's so intimidating, he's, yeah. And, yeah, she gets attacked by Hunt, and, yeah, a pretty good fight. And, and, and yeah, good detail about the, the gun, you know. Yeah, once a gun is wet, it's, you know, I feel like I've heard there are a few guns, but, like, your average gun is simply not going to work once it's wet. You know, it's, it's not made to withstand being underwater. But Peggy's was never underwater, so it's a nice little. Let's see and um, yeah, some more. Uh, um, Peggy talks to Wilkes, Doctor Wilkes again. Another good scene, and you know he's being very self-sacrificing and still. Very, very charming, very charismatic. And yeah, um, Peggy learns that Whitney is secretly a genius. And we have the, the great line, everyone is looking at her, but no one, <coughs> no one sees her or something like that, you know, which is, yeah, that is a, um, it, it is very, very clever for her to hide in plain sight like that. You know, nobody thinks that one of the top actresses is secretly this genius, especially back then it wouldn't. And... Let's see... Yes, and, and we see Thompson see the, the newspaper, and again, there's just this little bit, you know, he's... He clearly realizes, you know, this is exactly because because he noticed the weird wording. You know, Sousa had to translate Hollywood speak to New York for for Thompson, and you know, he he looks at it, and you know, there's he's not showing it to to them, but it's clear to the audience. Yeah, he he realized, and and even afterwards, he he looks back at it to like be sure, you know, nope, it's the exact wording, you know, this, like, that is a ridiculous convenience. Can, can, coincidence, uh, you know, if, if not, uh, you know, conspiracy. And, yeah, um, director Kenneth, uh, you know, goes to, to Whitney and, like, talk about burying the lead, like, d d not the worst thing he does in the scene, obviously, but, yeah, you know, like, he could have just started by saying, I made sure they didn't fire you, so here's the story, but no, he's, he starts by saying, they want to replace you, and it's like, just, yeah, and, um, you know, for, for like a second or two, you're like, what a, what a nice guy that he, you know, he just, he, <clears throat> at least claims he did. Uh, you know, uh, he's he claims that he put his career, or at least the job, on the line. You know, he said if if they replace you, I walk. They folded. You know, and and you know the, the hug because you know she's she's grateful, but then he holds the hug for longer than. You know, like, it's it's very clear from her body language that she thinks, okay, the hug is over now, you know, and then he's, like, touching her face. It's just really, really creepy, you know. it. 
straight up sexual assault, which sadly did happen all the time back then. You know, thankfully it's, you know, there's a little bit more, there's still a lot of people getting away with it, sadly. But we're going in the right direction now, at least with Me Too. And, you know, yeah, he, you know, yeah, and he, he freaks out when he sees that, you know, a small part of her her face, her forehead, you know, looks a little weird, you know, so clearly he doesn't care that much about her beyond her appearance and such. And, you know, yeah, she insists, you know, this is, it's, it's nothing. And then, you know, the, the, this, this guy who get who, who sexually assaults a, a woman gets sucked into a black hole. This is obviously not something that we can ensure will happen every time someone sexually assaults, but, you know, work is being done to, to, you know, if only. No, I, I'm obviously joking, but yeah, um, so that was interesting because she does have at least a little, well, I guess I'm not sure that's, that she's got control of it, but she now at least realizes that it can work to her benefit, you know, and, you know, again, excellent effects, like it really, the, the, um, that both that it's convincing and also just it's sufficiently like really messed up looking you know him getting like it's it's not just that oh he's he's there and then next second he's just gone no he's like getting messed up and and sucked into the thing just yeah very cool so some i'm to be trivia for this episode Howard Stark's comic book movie is based on one of Marvel's Old West heroes, Kid Colt. And the lab scene when Howard Stark is looking for his passport to go to Peru as Howard moves out of the shot, the camera focuses on a colored glass window with a white circle on a red background. The circle is the same sign as the miniature arc reactor Howard's son Tony Stark makes for his chest to keep him alive and power his Iron Man suits. Very cool. That was also when he's like walking away and says, "Oh, I gotta get some coffee," and then he walks back. He like walks right through Wilkes, and it's like, I mean, you're you've been trying to make the point that Howard is one of the few people who will actually give a black man a chance, and then you have him act like the black man isn't even there. So that's not, yeah. Let's see. When he is introduced, Howard Stark is seated on a crane on his movie set next to his director of photography, played by series cinematographer Edward J. Pye. One scene shows a movie marquee in the background reading Whitney Frost in Tales of Suspense. The Whitney Frost character first appeared in the Iron Man story in the Marvel comic Tales of Suspense, number one, volume 98, in February 1968. The cover of the comic features a scene from the Captain America story in that issue, Captain America fighting the Black Panther. A fight between these two superheroes occurred in Captain America's Civil War. A fictional Whitney Frost is credited here with inventing spread spectrum transmission, which uses frequency hopping to conceal classified transmissions. In reality, that technology was invented by an actual Hollywood star, Hedy Lamarr. Ms. Lamar, unlike Ms. Frost, was acting as a patriot in doing so. So that is very good. It's it's too bad that they, you know... But, they, it, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not saying that I would have wanted them to turn Hedy Lamar into a villain, but... But no, that is very cool. That it's it they they got inspiration for that from an actual Hollywood star. Which, yeah. While installing the security system, Edwin Jarvis remarks, "I have no intention of being a disembodied voice." This is obviously a reference to Tony Stark eventually using his voice, Jarvis, as the artificial intelligence in his future Iron Man suit. So, so yeah, very very cute. Uh, various headlines of the fictional newspaper, the Los Angeles Tribune, are shown. This periodical first appeared in the Marvel Universe in Savage She-Hulk number three in 1980. 
Peggy expresses her belief that a movie based on a comic book is a dreadful idea. This is an in-joke to the fact that the show is also based on a comic book. And... Let's see. Um, oh, <laughs> right. Whitney Frost was born... In this episode, it is learned that Whitney Frost was born Agnes Cully and is from Broxton, Oklahoma. In the comic book, the mighty Thor Thor had his home... Asgard transferred to the mortal plane which covered over hovered over a field in Broxton, Oklahoma until let's see, yeah, that's that's more. Anyway, um oh <laughs> Howard Stark signs his friend in Peru is named Abner Brody. This could be a reference to the Indiana Jones franchise, which had characters named Abner Ravenwood and Marcus Brody. And let's see. <clears throat> right, and and yeah, so in this episode we also hear that, you know, Jarvis isn't white enough for the arena club. You know, when he says something like he's 116th... Uh, okay, I don't even remember. Sorry, ADHD acting up again uh, but but yeah you know he you know one sixteenth and that's you know but that is sadly true of a number of of racists you know they're used to I, I think they called it the one drop rule or something like that you know one drop of blood from uh, you know some yeah someone not deemed white enough which you know originally included like the Irish. Now, right, um, yes, so I am going to try to do an episode tomorrow, and until then, I leave you with, <laughs> yeah, when, when Thompson, you know, makes a surprise visit, you know, yeah, Sousa starts saying, Jack, what, and Peggy finishes the sentence, an appalling surprise. <laughs>